Hi, Audrey and listeners. My name is Buckley Sampson, and I am a Los Angeles actress. I just wanted to share just some inspiration from the 2007 strike. I was a union member of 14 years working in the industry then. And what I want to share is I knew I had to do something um, to support my union brothers and sisters, especially the writers. And I found that what I could do would to pick it, to actually make time within my schedule to show up, wear my sag after shirt. And those experiences to me were the most magical because I knew I was, gosh, I didn't realize I was going to get emotional. Um, uh, sorry. Um, that I was participating in something bigger than myself, that I was a professional in my union. I was a professional actor, and I was supporting what I felt was just and right. So I don't know what the future holds, but I do know what I can do, which is to stand up, to pick it, to be seen, to be heard. And I encourage every actor to do the same. It is important. Thank you so much for what you do, Audrey, and I appreciate the time. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore, and I'm going to keep it quick because I want to get into this very important episode that we are discussing today. Strike, panic, prep. There's a lot to discuss. Today, I have on with me the incomparable Elizabeth Ho. She has been on this podcast many times. She is an incredible actress working in many mediums with a long and varied career with all genres and had lots of momentum and lots of space between the jobs as we are discussing in this season. And I am so grateful to her. We are discussing the possible strike we'll find out that are looking to be upon us and what that means for you and your career and I just want to shout out and say thank you to everyone who called in and left a listener message about their experience and the WGA strike of 2007 it's very helpful I hope that this gives everyone a lot of perspective and information going in please share this episode even if people are not frequent or fervent listeners of the Audrey Helps Actors podcast I hope that you will give this episode to them to help prepare everyone for what a strike means what you should be doing what you can be doing what is involved and what it means to the present and future of your career. This week's episode is brought to you by Casting Networks. Go to castingnetworks.com slash Audrey and use promo code Audrey60 for $60 off an annual premium membership. Thank you so much to them. They are helping us do fantastic, important work this year. All right. I hope you're on your way to an audition slash self-tape. Book it. Audrey helps actors because maybe we're all striking. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with the Audrey Helps Actors podcast. And today we have Liz Ho. Liz Ho. Hi, honey. Hi, babies. How are you? Good. I'm pulling up my research. Great. I had research, too. Oh, because we are both anxious <laughs> attachment styles. <laughs> we're n- nerds, really. <laughs> and we're like, I want you to do a good job. I literally woke up early this morning because I was too. like, I don't want to let down Audrey and her listeners. Okay. So I have you on today because I was like, gosh, a writer's strike is looming and other possible strikes also might be looming, including sag after our own union and the Directors Guild. But I wanted someone to come on and talk about the writer strike in specific from 2007 and how that affected you. And I'll talk about how that affected me because we have a lot of listeners who maybe just missed the boat on that. And good for you guys. Why did I just miss that boat? <laughs> I'm so thrilled for you. Also, you may not have been born yet. Great. Great. Thrilled. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Is there a 15-year-old actor? Probably. Probably. Listening, right? I, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd say that's and if likely. so, good for you. Welcome. I wish I had this when I was 15. God, God. I would have been such a nerd. I mean, so real. So kitted out. Somebody's talking about acting and I'm listening. <laughs> I'm taking notes right now. <laughs> I totally would have been the person working out and taking notes and then posting about it. Absolutely. Yeah, so those of you who do that, just know I feel you. We I'm hear, with you. We're here for you and we reflect that back. <laughs> so I got going in my career in 2004 the writer strike happened in 2007. I had a lot of momentum up until the writer strike. And not surprisingly, that stopped for me. And it took several years for me and a lot of people to get their momentum back. And what I want people to understand also is because Los Angeles, the industry of the town is show business. So when show business shuts down, essentially the town shuts down. And so it doesn't just affect the writers and the actors working on those shows that aren't being made or produced anymore or that direct industry, but does definitely also affect the service industry and catering and people going out and spending money in any area because everyone is now having to tighten their belt. I remember at my restaurant, I remember thinking this restaurant was like golden because I made crazy amounts of money there compared to where I'd worked just before. But I went from making $300 a lunch, true story, true, true story, to making $30 a lunch. And I believe the economy didn't really start to recover for like three or four years. So I want people to understand the ramifications about that. Do you have some factoids about the writer strike that you would like to share? I didn't have any factoids, but I mm. was listening to you and I was trying to put it into my own time frame. Mm. I graduated from college in 06. Mm -hmm. I got my equity card at the end of that year. Mm. I had great reps. Mm. And then I remember having a little bit of momentum and then summer came, strike happened. Mm. And then I disappeared down a dark hole of yes. service industry jobs. Ditto. And then I booked my first series regular the next spring. Fantastic. I know what a joyful Phoenix rising moment. And <laughs> maybe that will be what it is for myself, yourself, or yes. others. Yes. If this strike happens. Happy for everyone. Happy for everyone. I should say my first series regular job. I was fired. I was written off. Great. I was recast. So then came a bunch of struggling years. But I also think that has to do with the writer's strike mm -hmm. as well. So let's first go over the facts of the writer's strike. Let's go. And the Writers Guild versus SAG AFTRA versus the Directors Guild. And so this is for the TV film theatrical contract. For actors, we have multiple contracts at SAG AFTRA. And so if the voiceover contract is, say, on strike, you can still, as an actor, work the commercial contract or the TV theatrical contract. So TV theatrical is what's up to bat right now. And the order of it is that the WGA current contract expires on May 1st of 2023. So they are the first union to go into negotiations with the AMPTP, which is basically just producers. So they set the precedent for then what the directors and the actors can also bargain in fair, what would you call that? Like they got it, so we should too. Yeah, exactly, that's very professional. <laughs> so they are choosing their priorities and often the writer's priorities, the actor's priorities, and the director's priorities are very much in sync, which is basically pay me better. Pay me better as it contributes to a lot of things, residual income, Safety, often anti-racism, anti-sexism, inclusion, and contributions to health plans, retirement, retirement pension, all of those sorts of things. So all of those are things that are being fought for generally in every contract negotiation. And the previous writer strike happened in 2007. I was listening to a really great podcast, The Writer Strike Chronicles, made by the actress Tanya Barnes. We will post for everyone. That was an uh, actress who every day during the strike in 2007 went out to the picket lines and interviewed people on the picket lines about what was going on. That's really cool. So the strike started on November 5th, 2007. 
and it went 100 days and ended February 12th of 2008. I can't believe it was only 100 days long. It felt so much longer. I remember it being like a year-ish long but tragic event. It's like what you talked about earlier on is it affects so many different aspects of production, which then trickles down to the rest of the city. Also, what happened, which I think is similar to what we're going to be experiencing this time, that event happened in tandem with the economic collapse collapse due to the propping up of the housing market in that time, where U.S. corporations suffered $8 trillion in losses at that time. And no one is a stranger to what's happening now in terms of a rise of inflation, astronomical continuing to rise in rental Living costs, living costs all of massive that. tech layoffs, and bank closures. Yay! I can't wait to relive that at the same time again. Yeah, exactly. An impending recession seems to be on the rise, as everyone is saying to us. And those two things happening together, I believe, is what made it feel like just years-long catastrophe. And I believe the economy didn't really start to recover for like three or four years when I felt like my friends who had all gotten serving jobs and things like that to make ends meet started then booking enough more regularly and going back into their professional pursuits with a more consistent basis. Yeah. I was poor back then. Me so too. I just remember being like, cool, I'm going to be like this for a little bit longer. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Great. Yeah. Great. Good. And landlords, this is the thing that I really remember, were calling up their tenants and lowering their rent. They were like, I'm going to be lowering your rent $200 a month. And they didn't ask for it. Nobody was like, hey, can you lower the rent? But because so many people were leaving Los Angeles because they simply could not afford to, quote unquote, follow their dreams, that everyone just kept vacating the premise. Wow, that reminds me of like a pandemic that we... <laughs> May or may not still be going through. Oh but instead, they're like, we're going to raise this <laughs> shit now. I just remember my social media was like just hitting it where we would share like bigger context of what was going on. Right. We had more of a global view and the Internet was just like it's like a cute little trickle versus like the fire hose that it is now <laughs> right. that never turns off. Of destruction. Just, just so much destruction. <laughs> I remember thinking it's just the writer's strike mm -hmm. because there was no context. For me, also, I was young. Ditto. And I always had been told as a young actor, you will suffer for years and then it'll get better. And I mean, that's true of a lot of jobs in this industry. I think about, we were talking to Jesse about editing. Mm -hmm. I think about people who are learning being directors. I have a friend who is trying to get his master's in playwriting and is talking about Oof. maybe he's trying to get staffed on a room. And I'm like, Ugh. That's not how that works. <gasps> <laughs> like, you know, yeah. there is a lot of this industry that is based on the backs of young free labor. Yes, absolutely. And that really brings me to an incredible segue, Liz, about what the writers were. You missed her fantastic move. She I hair of, flipped she with hair no flipped. hair. <laughs> just hair flipped. Well, not no hair. The hair's up. She's got gorgeous hair. It's just <laughs> up. Have bangs. It's up bougie in a bun. We don't get, have time for this get, shit. Get ready say what go. you're going to say, Audrey. <laughs> They adore us and our banter. So the strike was about the working class creatives. As we can all understand, the wealthy class creatives, they're doing great. And the impoverished creatives, the ones who don't have any expectation yet that anyone should make a living off of their art, that's another sort of rung of the talent pool. And in between those two extremes is what you hope to be a healthy, vital, working class. Liz, how is the working middle class in general doing right now? We're doing so, we're just thriving. We can afford so many houses and vacations. And, and eggs. And eggs and just lattes and avocados all the time. Toast, uh, toast, 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 more toast. 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 <laughs> uh, it is wild to think about, I think about 2007, basically, mm -hmm. and I'm going to jump the gun a bit, I think, right. for your timeline, though, is about DVDs. 
literally right here on my list of what yes, we're talking about. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. And new media. And like we were talking about, the internet was a strange new thing. Um, but basically, they were looking at DVD royalties and how they were getting shafted. And we're approaching something so, so similar, but in a very different way. And catastrophic. <laughs> so <laughs> catastrophic! Are we panicked? Yeah, slightly. I'm pretty panicked. Okay, so to understand DVDs, we really have to go over residual income real fast because that's a big <laughs> thing that people are fighting for. Yes, I laugh because it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll join you in laughing. All right. Let's do a good laugh. <laughs> So the model that our industry was created on is called the residual model. And so how that works is, let's say you're in an episode of Law & Order, which airs on NBC. NBC then pays you to do the episode, and then they make money off of the commercials that air during that episode of Law & Order. But then they have a secondary stream of income when they play it over and over again in reruns, this thing called the reruns, where they rerun the episode. And so each time the network makes more money off of these ads, thereby making more money off of your work. So the residual model says NBC has to pay the creatives as NBC is also getting payment off of your work. So as you know from our last episode, what we discussed was that it's really important to have residual income because of the way that actors live these bang and bust lives. Because no matter how successful you are, no matter how long your career is, there is and will always be ups and downs. That's just the nature of the beast. So then what happened was a new secondary market was created called DVDs. So when NBC started selling DVD copies of, say, Law & Order, this is no shade on NBC, this is just networks in general, started selling DVD copies of their shows, the WGA said, great, you're continuing to make money off of our work, so you have to give us a slice of that. And then what ended up happening was the studios were like, but DVD sales, we just don't know if we'll ever make any money off of that. We're just going to have to wait and see. Please just trust us. We're just going to wait and see if anyone makes any money. And spoiler alert, the networks made buco, bigo, presto, changeo, excelente, mucho money. You guys, mucho money. So the writers got totally shafted, but the good news is the writers learned from that. So then when streaming came around and the networks decided, you know what, instead of rerunning this episode on TV, we're actually going to take this episode of Law & Order and we're going to put it on our own streaming service. So we're going to move it from re-airing on something in television that's going to have advertising on your actual physical television, and we're going to put it on our streaming internet platform service. And then the writers were like, great, love that you're going to go rerun our show on your streaming platform. You're going to have to pay us for that secondary stream of income. Not surprisingly, the studios and networks decided to try and pull the same thing again. We're like, but it's the internet. We just don't know. Like, is anyone even going to make money off of the internet? We're just not sure. But to quote Jesse, the writers were like, nah, fam, you did that with DVDs. You're not going to do it again with streaming. Mm -hmm. And I will say for me personally, it's this very interesting thing to everyone who is sort of a younger, newer member in any of the unions. Because in the beginning, you will like cut off your arm just so anyone puts you on television so that you can prove to yourself that your life isn't just a catastrophic joke, right? So you're like, please, look, mom, I'm on TV. And you do that a few times. And then you start thinking, yelza, I'm doing the math on this. This isn't particularly sustainable. And so then you start thinking, how long can I do a few jobs a year and make $3,000 and call it a profession? Hmm. And then you have people who are sort of so successful that they don't particularly rely on the actual union contract because they have reps that are getting them a different sort of value. However, Both groups are set by what we call the floor. So the floor is what the union, whichever union we're talking about, says you can't pay them less than this. And a lot of times what happens is the floor becomes the ceiling. And that's a very troublesome place for all artists to be in. And so the point I'm trying to get to is, used to be the creatives made the statement in our unions in the United States, you're going to pay me a residual income. I will accept a smaller payment up front for the day I film, 
knowing that you will give me a long tail of income as the years go by. But if megacorps are continuing to cut the residual model and also they're not paying anything up front, then we're fucked. Yeah. And residual income has been an imperative part of earning a living in this industry. And that's why we had a 2007 writer strike. Yeah. So this is part of why the writers are also really powerful as a union is because, A, they are smaller in number, which means that it's a smaller ship to steer. And they are a very smart, I find very angry, and I mean that with the greatest love, group. And you know, my husband is a writer. Your husband is a writer. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like Hell Hath No Fury, like a writer with a grudge. Yeah. And then when they have a bunch of friends, because they work in groups, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. like little gangs. They are like little gangs. Then they, you know, they form bigger gangs and <laughs> then they form a union. And that union is very thoughtful. I like the idea of them in like these little street writers games. Yeah, like, like snap. Like, da, 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 residuals, da, 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 pay my pension, ba, da, da. I like that. You should put that in the intro. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> okay. So why this is important for actors to understand and start preparing for, and as we had said, the writer's negotiations sets the precedent for our negotiations. So if the writers end up getting, which would be magical for them, I love it, 150% increase Woo! on residual payments on streaming video on demand, then that sets the precedent for the directors and us to go, I mean, the writers, you gave them 150%. You're going to have to at least give us 50 percent right please, please. please. can we please? please right and that sets the tone for all the other unions also hollywood is known in the country as an incredibly powerful union force so we very much set the tone for negotiations in unions and the success that we negotiate is then something that reverberates across the country and because we're now not just dealing with like a studio we're actually dealing with a major conglomerate that also owns a studio or three that also owns your cable company your phones and this car line this car line yeah great and this car line. Hollywood is getting smaller and smaller, mm. being owned by bigger and bigger corporations. Right. Which then, I guess, makes it easier for us to be like, this is what we want, mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. But if one of us folds, it sets a precedent for the other three. And also, there's something called collusion, just so everyone knows, that's illegal. Because wouldn't it be great... If we would just like talk to the WGA and we talk to the DGA and we're like, you guys, all of us are going to get this thing. And that's illegal. We can't collude with them. Obviously, it's a small town. Everyone's married to everyone else. Everyone's a like multi hyphenate. Especially now more than ever. But the WGA cannot go and have like a hash out meeting with SAG-AFTRA and then like negotiate as an even larger force. That's illegal. So it really is dependent on the writers coming up to what they believe is a fair ask and then holding their line. And then what I want to get to is then the support that the actors and the directors give them. So one of the things that happened last time, did you go and pick it? I did. I, I as well did. I had friends who crossed the line. These were writers or actors? Actors. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we should clarify what you can right. and can't work on. SAG at that time, SAG-AFTRA, and the DGA, they were not yet on strike. So if a movie had been written, it could then go to production and writers... Couldn't rewrite. Couldn't rewrite, couldn't continue any of that process. But the movie itself could go to production and actors and directors and IATSE and all the other crews could go and get work. Right? Correct. There's not against any laws or rules. Nope. It's just about support. It's support and mm -hmm. ethics. Ethics. Yeah. I remember watching shows right after Writer's Strike. Yeah. 
and being like, why do these shows suck? <laughs> because it was all the content that was right. produced without rewrites. Right. And or all... very quickly. Right. So what happens is the degree to which the actors and directors go and really physically show support to the writers is really setting the precedent that they're holding the line. We're going to hold the line with them because we're next. So the degree to which this is successful is the degree to which our negotiations will hopefully be more successful. Okay, but wait, Liz. You genius icon wizard you. Wait. I have to interrupt you. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you this Union Strike Experience. All right, this strike experience is brought to you by Casting Networks. That's castingnetworks.com slash Audrey. Promo code Audrey, 60 for $60 off a premium annual membership. Is the industry going on strike? We'll find out. No time like the present to save $60 and put it in your pocket or spend it on food because I like to eat. This platform has more high-quality roles that are booked than any other casting service. A premium membership lets you unlock unlimited casting billboard submissions, unlimited photo, video, and audio uploads, and exclusive iOS app features. I'm actually very excited about this app. I just booked a job off of Casting Network, so thank you, Casting Networks, for helping me make more money. I appreciate you. If you have a strike story or you have a listener question, please call in to 667-ACTOR-70. That's 667-ACTOR-70. Hello, Audrey and Audrey listeners. It is your friendly neighborhood Eeyore, Kate Siebel, reporting in from very high up in the air. I wanted to call in because I actually do remember the writer's strike. I'm the dinosaur. It's me. I had just come to L.A. I was fresh-faced and really excited. I was repped up. I had a great manager and a great agent. And about a month into the strike, I was dropped by everybody. And it was a really hard time. I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't get a manager. That's when I had to really dive into survival jobs like, you know, party poker dealing and like vodka promotions and waiting tables. And it was a really, really rough time. Also, though, reality TV happened during that time. So there would be no Fuckboy Island, which is literally my favorite show on TV if there wasn't a writer's strike. So, you know, silver linings. But I hope there are people who had great experiences during the writer's strike. I was not one of them. But I'm not just here to tell you tales of woe. Today something really cool happened. I have been bemoaning to Audrey, as she knows, about my space between the jobs recently. And I'm on a plane taking my kids on a spring break trip. And I turned on the in-flight system. And The Time Traveler's Wife, which is a show that's now canceled but was on HBO for one season, was on. And I was on it for a few episodes. And for the first time ever, I got to watch myself on an airplane. And I don't know, that made me feel really proud. So again, it's the little things. Hang in there, everybody. Feel your feelings. And you don't need the power of positive thinking to book a job. Love you. Mean it. Bye. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So you picketed. Do you remember your picketing experience? I do. It was at um, CBS by The Grove because I Mm. used to live over there. Mm. And I remember showing up and being real scared. Because I had never done something like this before, and mm. everyone was so welcoming. So welcoming. Did you have a sign? I did not have a sign. I was just a body. Love it. But I think they gave me a sign. I can't. I ended up holding a sign Great. at some point. I think it's someone was like, "I'm tired," and I was like, "Let's go." <laughs> but they were so lovely, and I remember feeling how you do on set, which is we're all in this together, and one cannot exist without the other. And I want to talk more about that idea of scripts being written prior to the strike being yes. called. Yeah. In During that time, I think it was 2006, mm-hmm. they were stockpiling scripts. Which they are currently doing now. But not to the extent that they did back then, mm-hmm. because we have so much more material and also unscripted TV is so popular mm-hmm. right now. I love unscripted TV. You and I both. Like, I think there is nothing better than watching straight up human condition, human conditioning, being narrowed through a lens. Yeah, massively produced. Absolutely. (laughs) And a producer being like, go over there, ask her this. So with reality TV, then I, as an actor, get scared that there becomes then a scarcity of work and roles 
for the rest of us. And you would be right to be scared because some of us of a certain age do remember a time when the internet didn't have a bunch of television shows. It was whatever was on the major networks, particularly the prime time. So 7 to 10 or 8 to 11, depending on what time zone you're on. And in these three-hour chunks, they jam-packed all this content. And at a certain point, that content became incredibly dominated by reality television. And so all of these actors who had made a living in television, suddenly their careers had vanished. And congruent with that, there were 217 movies shot and filmed in 2006, and then there were 17 shot in 2007. I'm no mathematician, but that does a math right. Those numbers ain't good. (laughs) Also, what happened was that corporations weren't making commercials because revenue was so short because a recession happened, so nobody was spending. So you had just this massive shrinking. And then here's the good news. We then did have a boom. Cut to 2016, so 10 years later, there was four times more original scripted content created in 2016 than in the previous 10 years combined. And it was a golden age. It was awesome. I had a great year in 2016. I did too. Great. Love it. Take me back. (laughs) (laughs) So all to say, this is scary information, but also, you know. So that's how things go. The waves go in, the waves go out. It's all cyclical. It's all cyclical. So I try not to panic and remember nothing is permanent. The good times and the bad. <clears throat> I have a friend in post-production. So while their show wrapped their season, mm-hmm. normally before they start pre-production on the next season, mm-hmm. their team finds work on a pilot. And I was like, how's that going? And they were like, we cannot find a pilot to do post on yeah. for 2023. I was like, well, that's troubling. (laughs) She goes, well, you know, writer's strike. And I was like, I've heard of these rumblings. Tell me more. And then I went to my manager and I was like, what do you think this is? And he was like, well, I hope not, but it looks like. Likely. More than likely. I remember being very, like the, I can feel my body like tensing up right now. (laughs) Like just the chills of like, oh no. And I do also have to say as a woman who is now considered old. (laughs) I think you're young and gorgeous. Thank you. You too. (laughs) It does make me a little scared to think about my age category Mm -hmm. and type. But then also remembering I've been through it before. I had great success afterwards. I think television, the medium that I love the most, Mm -hmm. had a great renaissance. It feels like sometimes we have to get to these really low places for our industry to evolve. What I want to also talk about is like how you're going to prepare. I'm going to talk about what I'm considering to to prepare. (laughs) Oh, I'm so excited. Like we're preppers? Yeah, as though we're preppers. Okay. And also what others can do during this time. One thing that happens is contract negotiations come out and then you will see a lot of publicity about how every corporation is broke. It's almost like they have money for PR. Exactly. And so a big strategy is hiring PR teams to do two things. One is to really publicize how broke they are and then really publicize how greedy and trashy artists are. So they will hold up the 1% of successful creatives and be like, did you see how much money so-and-so made and -and so-and-so made? They're making a million dollars an episode and they want to go on strike. They need more money. Audrey, I know we're role-playing and I'm getting so angry at you right now. (laughs) Tell me why. Why are you getting angry? Why? Because we don't get enough episodes. We don't Mm -hmm. get 22 to 26 anymore. We don't even get one, maybe two seasons if we're lucky. We don't get to see the data from streaming services to Mm -mm. see what we're worth. What we're worth, if we're worth it, Mm -hmm. what is popular, what is not popular, Mm -hmm. what do those demographics mean. And then I think about how we just keep on lowering the amount of money we get paid, specifically for actors. But Mm -hmm. I think this is also true for writers. It is. In the room, they have mini breakout rooms, which is bullshit, Mm -hmm. which means in the pre-production stage, writers are in a smaller room. It's usually the head writer and their top writers, which means the lower writers, usually people of color, diversity, Mm -hmm. women, are not necessarily included in that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the big decision making and storytelling doesn't happen with a full room. And an inclusive room. And an inclusive room. 
room. And then what happens to those baby writers or just your full writing staff who mm-hmm. doesn't get to be in that room? They don't get the full room rate mm-hmm. for a whole mm-hmm. season. And also they don't get the experience. And so if Megacorp are like, well, we just don't have enough experienced writers in that category. And it's like, well, right, because we're not giving them experience and also we're keeping them poor. So then any little morsel that we offer to them, they're going to have to take. And so part of what a union's job is, is to say, that's not acceptable. We're going to hold together. And those of us who are doing very well are going to stand with those of us who are struggling as one united group and say this is unacceptable. It's so short-sighted of corporations to not invest. It's capitalism. I get it. Like, we've all bowed down to this god and it's fucking us over. (laughs) But it's just wild to me that, like, you make more money when a show is popular. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. you sell more things. Mm -hmm. You get more views. Why Mm -hmm. wouldn't you invest in these things that make you more money? But as we see, at least from my point of view, systemically in our culture, I think about medical students. I think about lawyers. I think about education systems in America today. We are not investing in that, right. which boils down to the apprenticeship apprenticeship and mentorship hmm. of people mm-hmm. in this industry. Yes. Also known as exploitation. Whoa, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> And so one of the things that I want everyone to keep in mind, if you're out and about and you're hearing what I would call union-busting rhetoric, just know that that is intentional and that there's a massive movement on the part of the megacorps to implant anti-union rhetoric and say things like, well, we're not making money. And just as an example, the last writer strike, the WGA members, they said, listen, if they're not making money, then we're not making money. We're not asking for them to give us money they're not making. We're saying they're getting money. So when they make it, not when they don't, but when they do, we deserve a fair share of that profit. It's also not It's not like we're saying we need a million dollars for everyone right now this instant. Mm -hmm. We're saying in the future. I think that's a really big distinction. Mm -hmm. And tell me about that distinction. I was just thinking about union busting, and I remember being younger, not understanding what that meant, what that rhetoric meant, Mm -hmm. and just how important it is to be active in your union. And I think also social media, I mean, if we can just stop the infighting, social media does help keep us more educated and we're really lucky to have a podcast like yours thank you it makes me also think about how actors are on the bottom rung of a ladder and so we're very much like we'll take whatever Mm -hmm. you want me to do what great Mm -hmm. i'll do it for free Mm -hmm. and we're very much brought up into that culture of exploitation and so when union busting rhetoric comes out it's easy for us to be like sure that makes sense Mm -hmm. is it going to be over can i work again now Mm -hmm. coming from a place of a lack versus looking at a bigger picture Yeah, like a generational picture. So what I hear a lot from actors is the internets, the internets, the internets. We're not making money off the internets. And it's like, okay, they were fighting for that in 2007. And so the degree to which people showed up in 2007 is the degree to which that got represented. And so if you are now feeling like you're not getting paid enough to make a living, which I'm going to guess is true for you if you're listening, then the degree to which you show up and participate in the conversation and the holding the line and also encourage others to show up and participate, that's the degree to which we continue to set the precedent forward so that five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when Gen Z turns 40, they're like, thank God everyone showed up 10, 15 years ago to fight for us. This is going to sound real stupid, but Mm. I'm still going to say it. As actors, our job is to have empathy for others Mm -hmm. and hold witness to those vulnerable experiences. How could we not? Yes. And to say, like, no, I'm going to hold space for a corporation. I think that's the thing that people don't understand is, like, I'm going to hold space for this corporation. I'm good. Corporations be good. They're They're fine. They don't don't need more space. They don't need my space. space. (laughs) They don't. They They don't. Listen, and, like, I'm glad that to whatever degree they are contributing to pay my bills. Great. Sure. And the only people who are going to look out for our best interests are us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the process of fighting for our own rights and payments through SAG-AFTRA. That way in several months, 
if our union, SAG-AFTRA, votes to go on strike as well, our listeners have like a deeper understanding of what the steps are that got us to this point. So let's talk about the working and wages meetings. They are currently wrapped in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We are going to what's called the plenary committee. Do you want to take a stab at telling them about? No, I'm going to be because I'm going to say a bunch of wrong numbers. Okay, that's fine. I'm just going to listen to you and just Mm -hmm. give you googly eyes. Love. Just uh, add charming things in the middle so it's not okay. Good. Okay. So in the beginning. They have all these different topics, and by they, I mean the unions. Each region has their own meetings. Day one, we're going to do a general meeting and discuss what are we thinking about. Day two, we're going to talk about inclusion and diversity. Day three, we're going to talk about health and pension. Day four, we're going to talk about auditions. Day five, we're going to talk about residual income. And they just keep going, and every day you have a topic. And then actors show up and say, this has been my experience. Because this has been my experience, I believe something in the contract needs to change. And often somebody that works within the union, what's called staff, says, actually, that's already in the contract. You got screwed over. Please email me at such and such sagafter.org and we will file a claim and we will get that corrected. What if it's not? Then the actor says, thank you for that little button. Yeah, you're welcome. The actor then says, this needs to be in the contract. And someone else says, I second that. And sometimes someone will say, I disagree. Mm-hmm. I do not want that in the contract because of this other repercussion that maybe people aren't thinking of. And then a discussion is had. And so why it's important for people to show up to these is because one actor's issues, depending on their gender identity, their race, their age, their economic status, all sorts of things, one actor's problem is different from another actor's problem. And often it's hard to know what you don't know about what someone else is experiencing. That is called progress, hopefully. Then what happens is you attend a certain amount of those meetings, six to be exact, and then you get invited into the smaller group. And the smaller group comes together, and it's great that it's six meetings attendance. Tell them why that's a good thing. You want to be exposed to as many different topics as possible, but also to really get a bigger feel for a much bigger population than just yourself. Right. Because for this contract in specific, we have stunts involved. We have background involved. We've got dancers. We've got clowning. We've got puppeteers. We've got all of it. We just have all the the categories. We've got so much talent (laughs) in our union. It's just like buckets of talent. So you shouldn't be participating in contract discussions unless you are aware of that full picture. So you attend six meetings or more, and then you get invited into the smaller group. And in that smaller group, they go through the topics that have been decided upon to be discussed further. And then eventually, all the regions come together. New York says, this is what we decided. And other regions go, this is what we decided we care for. And everyone comes up with what's actually going to be fought for. Because as you can imagine, the needs of actors living in New Mexico are different than the needs of actors living in Los Angeles. That's why also there are region-specific contracts. Oh, my What? What? So great. And then after that, the points of what we are willing to budge on and what we're not willing to budge on become clear. Strategies are discussed. And actors go in with our hired negotiators and negotiate for a long time with the producers. I know when I was younger, Mm -hmm. I did not understand how long they negotiate for. Tell them about that. Because I feel like all I see is the shiny, shiny of it at the Mm -hmm. very end, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I do love a good shiny thing. Me too. And so when it comes down to voting on these proposals at the end of the day, all I see is the shiny, shiny. What we don't see are the months of negotiating with producers who they have really good lawyers they do. and a lot of money. Yes. So it is very hard to negotiate on mm-hmm. things. And mm-hmm. so I often find that even when we're doing votes for union leadership, I think people forget how that even if someone is famous or we, oh, that's someone from so-and-so show. Like, mm-hmm. that's so cool. Mm-hmm. I like them on TikTok. <laughs> I don't think they realize that a big part of their job is to also deal with other unions mm-hmm. and to sit and to negotiate for us. Mm-hmm. We can't have someone who's just hot-headed. They have to see the bigger picture. Right. And fight for also the minority 
whatever that minority is, right? Because it's easy to say the job of the contract is to satisfy the majority of the membership. But if the majority of the membership then discounts certain groups and what those groups might be up against, then those groups get lost in the dust and their needs get lost in the dust. And I want everyone to know the degree to which you are letting others show up instead of you is the degree to which your needs are getting left off the table. Now, by the time you're hearing this, the W&Ws is over. So this is for you to understand. I'm just planting seeds in your head for the next W&Ws. You'll hear me called W&Ws. You'll hear me talk about them. And I know it's scary to attend the first time, but everyone's always like, oh, I just, I just literally sit here and listen. That's it. And sometimes they're even on Zoom. I mean, now I think they're all on Zoom now, right? So you just like show up. I had a glass of wine. I put my camera on mute and I just listened. Everyone that I talk to who attends them leaves feeling so inspired and so informed and so, I think, shocked about how much work is being done on the actor's behalf by other actors that they just didn't even realize. Because what we, th- I at least for me, I mm-hmm. think when we look at the union, the closest we get to it, if you aren't attending meetings or thinking mm-hmm. about bigger picture, is the contract that you sign mm-hmm. in your trailer. That's right. And this is also to give understanding to everyone that when a contract is negotiated and the union comes out and says, hey, we negotiated this contract for you, and then you always have and should have a dissenting group. And so these are people within the union who are like, this contract is fucking bullshit. Get us more. Do better. What I want everyone to understand is it wasn't like everyone woke up that day (laughs) and was like, let's go negotiate a contract. And they were like, sure. Oh, let's talk to producers. Let's just do this this one time. And we'll just sit there, like, have a light lunch. Like, I'll have a light salad. Maybe we'll split an entree. Exactly. We'll make some decisions. (laughs) And then, like, boom, it's done. That's not what occurs. No. And so when the contract comes out for us to vote on, it didn't come to fruition quickly or randomly or easily. It was this long process that I'm telling you about of regionally each group talking about what their needs are for months and then going to a smaller group and then into a smaller group and then those groups getting together and then for months talking about what they want. We started our W&Ws in, I think, November. Our contract doesn't expire until June. So we have been doing this four months by the time you hear this episode. And that is not to say a dissent is wrong. That is not to say that. No, it's important. It is an important thing to be considered and fought for. Also, and this time around, with the possibility of a writer strike and to say, well, if the strike does end up happening, that puts us in a different position of power. Maybe. Perhaps. We don't know. We don't know. Tell us what happens, you guys. (laughs) And gals. And and people. Great. Okay. So anything else you want to tell anyone about what they can or should be doing during this time? Oh, we're talking about prepping? Sure. Anything that could or should be happening in the loom of a writer's strike? I mean, honestly, by the time this airs, the last writer's strike, they did a strike months before Mm -hmm. their contract ended Mm -hmm. and caught producers off guard. So for all we know... By the time they're listening to this, we oh, may not. They may not even strike, and they may not even strike. We're not sure. I'm giving you this episode so you have information. Wouldn't that be lovely if, <laughs> like, lovely. this episode came out and none of it happened? <laughs> but so now great. you know the process, yes, yes. so that anxious future <laughs> yeah. you can prep for another a, strike a scenario <laughs> that may or may not happen. <laughs> Tools in your box. <laughs> We're just anxiety-inducing here. That's what we're doing. Education. It's education. Yeah, it is. And so if the recession is compounded by a or several strikes and you are feeling the reverberations of that, I just would love to be an encouraging, positive presence in your ear that says, if things are slowing down, it doesn't necessarily mean 
that you're doing something wrong, that you're working improperly. In terms of how people can maybe prep or move thoughtfully forward, what are your thoughts? As you were speaking, it made me think about during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone just stops. Mm -hmm. It really sucks. At the time, I think that's when TikTok really jumped off for people. You know, there's always going to be different ways to express creatively. Mm -hmm. I think what you do and encourage people do in terms of like self-taping mm -hmm. for practice is really helpful. For me, I've become a huge reader. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm on book number 20 of this year. What? I know, right? Of 2023? Of 2023. What yeah. is wrong with you? That's I'm crazy. I'm just devouring story. Wow. And the more I devour story, the more I, it makes it easier for me to understand my place in story. I am not the kind of person who is a multi-hyphenate mm. in this particular industry. So I'm not like Liz is also a writer right. and a comedian and a producer. She's an amazing crafter though. You I, guys. I do love crafting and that's okay. I had a lot of people tell me, well, you just got to write something. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I encourage you to follow your intuition, mm -hmm. to take the time to take care of yourself. I wish if I could go back and... This is true of me at any point to be mm -hmm. like, therapy. Yes. Great. Let's try it. You and I love therapy. Uh, <laughs> shout out to therapy. <laughs> yeah. I should have that therapist on again, right? Yeah. yeah she was great. Yeah. yeah. The more work you do on yourself, the better mm -hmm. you're going to understand your place and character and story. Mm -hmm. And then also you'll have more empathy for the bigger human experience. That's right. There are some things that I do neglect when I'm busy as an actor. Family, friends, traveling. A lot of my friends haven't traveled in a long time and are planning travels during what is likely to be a strike season. I am. I know that you are. So if you are a person who's been travel averse, either for pleasure or for family duties, that's a good time to plan those things. Also, if you were thinking about having time to get materials together or having time to earn some real money when things are slow, go and get that other job, go and make extra money so that when things settle, you are in a positive financial position to hopefully take advantage of some momentum once it starts going back. Also, I think therapy is so good. Some things I wish I had done was prepared more in the direction in which I wanted more growth. I knew that I wanted more growth in television. I wish I had done more reading, watching, practicing, learning, absorbing the thing that I wanted momentum in and gotten my hair cut maybe once in those two years instead of really just feeling victimized. Did you end up getting bangs? Eventually, but I like not till 2010. Wow. I like look back at my photos from like 2007. You were in a very big depressive state. I was in a very big depressive state. Yeah, because yeah. you know a haircut is like change yes right right that's yeah. like you it's a one of the biggest indicators of like you taking care of yourself that's mm. why after a breakup yeah someone's like i'm gonna get my hair done yes, right right, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. that's what it yeah. it's really interesting yeah i mean i know people who had met me and they talked about knowing me at that time as somebody who was like really upset <laughs> sorry i don't mean to laugh no it's funny though right it's funny because you are not that's not like when people are like, tell me no. about Audrey. Like, God, she is so upset. <laughs> right? I mean, I am, but like I'm upset with enthusiasm at the same time. Like that's sort of my vibe. And I was not upset with enthusiasm apparently. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I just was really going through something. It just really speaks to how important community and network is. So and important. then it makes me think about the union. Yes. How important the union is. It's community yeah. and network. People are always asking me, how can they learn more about their contracts? How can they learn more about getting what is actually rightfully owed to them? How can they make friends with people that are a little bit ahead in their career? And I have the same answer every time. And I'm like, just start going to union things. Because if your only exposure is people at your own level, then you don't know what you don't know. And literally, you can just hop on Zoom and just listen and start to hear what people who are five years ahead, two years ahead, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and the journey that they've had 
you will learn and you will do better because you know more. I will say I do miss the in-person in that you could make real, I feel like Zoom is, you know, you have a screen. So there's less of that genuine human connection if you do see someone in a meeting Mm -hmm. and you really resonate with Mm -hmm. what they're saying and you can create that kind of relationship. It's harder. Yes. Go have coffee afterwards. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. I'm hoping that Marie this Marie Calendars. I know. Marie <laughs> Calendars! <laughs> LACMA. Okay. Uh, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, cool. I love you so much. Thanks for having me back. You you, guys... it's, I learn so much when I'm here. And I come thinking I know things, but I don't. <laughs> Audrey helps actors because... We don't know anything. <laughs> we don't know... <laughs> Anything. Anything. I'm hopeful we can have you on just as many times as you'll allow me because you always provide such great perspective. And as we get older, there are fewer and fewer and fewer people that I feel like I can actually have a conversation with about the industry in a toe-to-toe way and that are connected to both the same and other people in this industry and you always have such wonderful points of view that I think are that really took a while to, to get to. So <laughs> thank you. I'll take the wonderful yeah. points of view and likewise. And I just maintain this relationship so that when I'm on shoots, I can text you <laughs> like I did. Hey, X Y Z question about X Y Z, and then you respond. And I'm like, hey, uh, A B C. And I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> that makes so much sense. So good. Well, thank you for coming on, and we're gonna end with mildly interesting. What have you got? Oh, fuck. I've got one. Hold on. I'll I'll start. Go for it. Okay. My mildly interesting, I really want to know if you own this yet, because if you don't, you're going to. It's the iSonic Ultrasonic Cleaner. Do you know about this? What is this? Okay. So. Is it, does it like vibrate? Yes. Okay. Go on. So my, it does sound like a vibrator is like happening in my bathroom. It may be, but it's the iSonic Ultrasonic Cleaner. My mom got it for me for Christmas and I was like, mom, what is this fucking thing that you bought me? You can put anything in there so you put your glasses it's the thing when you go to an optometrist and you put your glasses in there and they come out sparkly perfect like clean. my retainer your retainer Boom. can go in there my retainer goes in there also all your jewelry gets a little little tarnish on it mm. you just throw it in and it goes and it like vibrates the I shit i should have put of my it. ring in there while we were doing this well we'll do it right now it only Ugh. takes two minutes what <laughs> sold Buying it right now. So great. Okay. Anything for you? I have two things. Great. One mildly interesting thing is Libby, mm. which is a library app. Mm-hmm. That is how I've been able to read so much. And cool. it's not just reading on your Kindle or on your iPad or whatever. It's audiobooks. Oh. I'm usually reading two books at a time, meaning like I'm physically reading one. Yes. And then I'm listening to one while I do the dumb shit I do around my house, which is usually being sad. And then the other thing I was thinking about, so that's free. Great. You just have to have a library card. Love. And let's say you don't have a library card. You can pretty much register for a library card online now anywhere. You can. Super easy. True. The other thing is what I'm wearing, which is called a Conqueror. <gasps> Conqueror ring. It's a terrible name. Great. Think Conqueror plus ring. Um, it's a fidget ring. <gasps> and it doesn't look like... A crazy fidgety ring. It's very satisfying. It's very satisfying. You can spin it, but Mm -hmm. you can also, if you push down on it, it like pops out and you can click it and it doesn't, you heard it click. It's very satisfying to fidget Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. um, and it helps me focus. So like during this podcast, I was very quietly fidgeting, but it doesn't look like I've taken out. I don't know, like um, one one of those poppers or Mm -hmm. like a fidget tool. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have like Mm -hmm. fun stones and colors and stuff. This is great. Um, But I like it because it looks just like jewelry. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to get a link for this and then we'll clean it when we wrap. Thank you for coming. Thank you, babies. Okay, great. And I'm going to clap again. Next week on Audrey Helps Actors, we've got Erica Bream. We are talking about casting directors and we are talking about self-tapes and auditions and all of the things that have been up on social media recently. We're getting into it. It is really a wonderful, wonderful episode. We don't let each other off the hook and it is, I think, quite entertaining. Thank you so much to Liz Ho for her incredible contributions, hilarity, compassion, talent, love. I love this dear woman. Her dog recently passed, and let's all just give her a nice virtual hug. She deserves it. She's so generous. So, Liz, I appreciate you, and thank you as always. 
This episode was produced by Jesse Lumen, mixed and mastered by Thomas Hank Snodgrass. Show music by Ari De Niro, theme song by Alok Mehta and 108 Hill. This episode was edited by my wonderful husband, Jesse Lumen. This is a very important cause near and dear to his heart as well. So thank you, Jesse, for all of your work. All right, everyone, don't forget your towel. It is going to be messy out there. We'll find out. Also, thanks again as we wrap up to our wonderful sponsors for the 2023 season, castingnetworks.com slash Audrey, promo code Audrey60 for $60 off a premium annual membership. Listen, you need to have Casting Networks. You have to... You have to subscribe to Casting Networks. It's part of the actor toolbox. Like, it's a thing that when you get into this industry, you join Casting Networks. The agents are like, okay, well, you got to get on Casting Networks. So I would love for you to save money in doing that. So please save money. Please take $60. Please take it. Take it and have it. If you are listening to this podcast for the first time because you are listening to the writer's strike, the st- possible industry strike episode as its own specific thing that someone sent you, I hope that you too will use this promo code and get $60 off the annual premium membership. That's castingnetworks.com slash Audrey, promo code Audrey60 for $60 off a premium annual membership. Thank you, everyone, for contributing to this very important episode. Please share it.